Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Blackstock, and I pastor the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in today to the Faith Connection broadcast. These programs are recorded live at our church each week at our services on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and then again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We would love for you to be a guest at our church and join us for our services. I believe you'd find our people to be friendly and you'd find a great welcome in our church. We would love to have you as our guest. You can find out more about Lighthouse Baptist Church by going to our website at lighthouse-baptist.com. We really hope these programs are a blessing to you today. And thank you again for tuning in to the Faith Connection broadcast. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. Savior's love. It's number one in the hymn book. If you want to use it, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. that uh, <clears throat> we benefit from every service that we come here. My, my great goal, my desire, my intention is to give you vital truths that will bless your life and give you what you need to. The Bible said if we continue in the word, then are we his disciples indeed. And we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. Right, and um, 
I, I work diligently to to um, to bring you Bible truths to every sermon, every message that I that I can, so that you um, are being fed the truth of the Word of God. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can accomplish in church. A lot of things that um, we could try to do, and we there's a lot of things we do. We enjoy singing, we enjoy fellowship, we shake hands, we greet one another, we pray. Um, but I feel like to have a great church, uh, it's got to be based on the truth of the Word of God. Amen. I talked this morning about how to have great things, and my goal is uh, not to be a great preacher, perhaps, or not to um, be renowned in my name or anything like that, but to, uh, I have a goal for greatness within the discipleship and the teaching and the training so that you're, you're a, a family of God that is grounded solidly on the Word of God, and the devil can't blow you around with every wind of doctrine, uh, that you're firmly established, that your children grow up in an environment uh, of victory and, uh, and truth so that they're, they're not um, uh, susceptible to the lies of the devil. Uh, that's my goal, and I hope that we I pray. I, I'll spend time tomorrow, one of my, my, my Monday prayers, is God that you'd bless what was done on this day uh, so that he'd bring fruit to our labors, that it wasn't in vain and that people received what was uh, delivered and that I delivered it in a way it could be used. So I hope that's the case. and hope tonight that we answer some things. Uh, I feel like that um, every year as we get closer and closer to Hell's Gates, even throughout the year, we have people that um, ask questions. They, they come to us, and I, and I, and I have uh, individuals from the church. You, you'll, you'll come to me occasionally. Different ones will say, somebody asked me this question, and I had somebody just, just about, I think last week, you know, called me and said, um, I was talking to somebody about the program, and they had a lot of questions about where they thought it was um, appropriate, the way we do what we do. And uh, last year, I produced a track that we gave everybody that came to the program that would want to take one, at least. And uh, it um, uh, gave some scripture verses that um, uh, identify the, uh, the rationale behind the Hell's Gates program. Tonight, I want to give you a Bible study that will answer the question, is it, uh, is it scriptural and ethical? Is Hell's Gate scriptural and ethical? And, uh, and I want to give you, for your own personal benefit, so that you have the uh, solid foundation in what the Scripture has to say about what we're doing and um, should we, whether we should do it or not. But I also want to give you uh, the answers that you need uh, for those that would ask questions because, you know, a lot of times people make statements that they, they're emotion-based. They don't really have any... Uh, that maybe heard somebody else say it. And um, so tonight I want to address the matter of Hell's Gates and whether it is scriptural and is it ethical for us to use a program like we do to try to um, deliver a gospel message to people in hopes that they'll trust Christ as their Savior. And I think it'll be helpful to you. I had all intentions of giving you a handout, and I went to print this afternoon and didn't realize that we're completely out of toner in our, in our printer. And so I'll make it available to you as soon as we get some a new supply of toner in, and uh, then we'll have handouts available because I know that you um, would like to have a resource that you can use down the road that uh, will help you as you uh, seek to answer questions. Appreciate everybody that's working hard to make um, things happen. The scene directors that are working diligently to, to accomplish um, uh, the preparation necessary to get ready for the program. All those who are working in other areas of direction and trying to get everything together, we appreciate all the hard work and um, the Lord sees it all. Amen. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. The Bible said, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Amen. And, um, you know, I'd rather not to give you too much of a payday because it just robs you what you got down the road. Matter of fact, I think that's the great, uh, one of the great um, uh, evils or um, uh, negatives, if you will, to prosperity theology. Because if you do what you do to get something now, then, then no matter what you've done for Christ, Jesus said it, if you do it be, to be praised of men, or, or if you do it for an a immediate reward, then you have your reward. Right, right. But if you do it just for the, for the glory of Christ, then you have an eternal reward. Amen. And I would not want to motivate you to do something that would rob you of a heavenly reward. I think we ought to do what we do for the love of Christ yes. and obedience to His commands to fulfill the objective of, of what God's left us here for. Uh, I do believe that there's blessings to be had for being faithful to Christ, uh, but I, I don't want to do it in such a way that it motivates you to do it for the wrong reason and lose your eternal reward. And uh, I do say thank you for all the hard work. We couldn't do it without you. Um, there's no way that, that um, I decided at the very beginning of the program that uh, it would be impossible for one person to manage the entire program. And so we decided, decided to develop directors for so many. I think we've got 14 or 15 directors 
within the Hell's Gate program. And each one of you um, uh, have a great deal of latitude and autonomy in that area to make it happen. And so when it does happen, you, you know that, um, uh, you know, the Lord sees the work you put into it. With that in mind, I also want to encourage you to, to work closely. I do, I do talk with the scene directors. I, we do have great, I have communication with, with each scene. I have communication with other directors for different various aspects of it. And I'm working within the, with the directors to make sure we stay into a focus. Sometimes <clears throat> in one scene, if, if all you do is focus on your scene, then uh, I look at the big picture. I see from the, the initial scene to the, to the last scene. And I, and I try to keep a balance in, in what, what people see. Because um, if, you know, when you're working one scene, that's all that you really see of the whole program. And sometimes if you, you, you can intently get, uh, you, you do it, sincerely try to make that scene the best it can be. But it has to fit within the overall scheme of the entire program. You can't, no book stands on one chapter. It has to all work together. Amen. And so work with your scene directors. Um, uh, I, I've talked to some recently about uh, trying to, you know, every year we seem to have a somewhat of an emphasis. Um, this year, the village scene particularly, I talked with Eric a good bit about what we're trying to accomplish. If you're in the village scene, please um, work with him. What our goal uh, this year, more than anything else, uh, is to, to move a little bit away from um, so much of the, the militant aspect of that scene. I know, do know that we have some things in that scene in which people are being pressured to, because they, can't, they don't have the, their mark and they can't buy nor sell. They can't, and that's all scriptural. And there's, a, there's a two witnesses who are going to have to um, defend themselves as scriptural says they will with fire proceeding and um, uh, consuming their enemy. But in the midst of that scene, what I would really like to create uh, is a very compassionate scene. I would like for every person that comes to Hell's Gates when they go to the village to feel great empathy for the plight of the individuals who are living during the Great Tribulation. That they won't be able to get food. They won't be able to get services. Somebody said, well, if they take the mark, they're going to get, they're going to get all they need because the government's going to provide it. Well, you've got to realize in the Tribulation, there's going to be lots of plagues. There's going to be lots of destruction. A lot of infrastructure is going to, you know, as God sends these plagues down to, to get the attention of, of the lost people, uh, there's going to be a lot of problems on this earth. And even though, uh, you know, uh, the government will make a lot of promises, uh, they rarely fulfill all their promises. Amen. And so there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a, a lot of difficulties in the tribulation period for those who take the mark and those who don't. Those who don't ultimately will be martyred, but those who do still won't get all the services they want. They won't have all the food that they need. They won't have all the medical attention. There's going to be plagues. There's going to be great disease. There's going to be famine. There's going to be all kinds of problems in this time. And I would like for that scene to grip the hearts of everybody that goes through there with the idea that, man, these people are suffering. It's, it's just going to be a, in which their hearts would go out, that, you know, to the extent that I don't want to have to live through that. Okay? There's, there's, going to be, there's going to be a lot of other times when the intensity of the, the recruitment building there in which people are being pressured to take the mark, ultimately in the underground church where people are going to be martyred and these things are taking place. And then they go to the great white throne in which they're going to stand before God and be judged because their names are not written in the book of life. But in that village scene this year, if you're working in that scene, work on your dialogue, work on everything you can to help make that, uh, to, to draw uh, an empathy from the viewer, from the audience, so that they feel a great empathy and compassion for people that are suffering so greatly during that time period. So that, you know, we're just trying to help us all stay on the same agenda here and make it work because I feel like that, um, that there's a great opportunity, a door, an effectual door open and us to see many people, um, come to the reality that, uh, that one day that trumpet's going to sound. Amen. And the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. And everybody needs to be prepared. Amen. All right. A lot going on this week. Um, we are, we got uh, about 80% um, of the heating air work done uh, in the new auditorium. And uh, we um, are looking to sand sheetrock and get prime coat of paint on this week. We also look to, I think Brother Alfonso is planning on starting maybe Wednesday, putting the ceiling grid in back there. And uh, perhaps by the end of the week um, or the first of next week, um, we'll have all the HVAC operational up and running um, and uh, so there's a lot uh, of things going on in the remodel aspect of that and so we're making progress our intention is to uh, get that space uh, about that far along with the sheetrock uh, prime coated and the heat and air system in and the ceiling grid in and um, 
then start cleaning up and getting ready for our anniversary service to be down there and Hell's Gates. And once Hell's Gates is finished, we'll come back and try to finish up the rest of the remodel project. Uh, and um, shouldn't take us too long after that to get done. And we're excited about what um, progress is being made. All righty. Good to see you tonight. Looking forward to our time in our Bible study. And um, praying that you have a, have a good week. And we pray one for another. All, all, all you that are in Hell's Gates, uh, I appreciate it. You know, we only got we only had two more Sunday night services before we hit the string of four weeks without Sunday night services. The, the, uh, the anniversary service, we'll have um, morning service, and then we'll have afternoon service, and uh, then we'll be back for the evening. And then we'll have three Sunday nights during the Hell's Gate program, which we're doing Hell's Gates rather than having a, a preaching service in here. We'll actually be um, having an evangelistic service uh, uh, out there for the Hell's Gates program. So, so we got two more weeks of Sunday night. Be faithful to the services and encourage everybody else to be faithful. If there's any time that the devil would like to uh, drive a wedge between us and uh, to get us crossway spiritually, it'd be the next few weeks. And so uh, we need to be very faithful um, uh, to every service. And I appreciate your faithfulness to that. Encourage one another, pray one for another, and let's make sure that um, we um, are walking in the light so that uh, the devil can't get to us. Amen. All righty. Good to see you tonight. Brother Frank. All right. Stand with me one more time. Last week we were on a break and I had, uh, we had two sessions going and one of the guys in another session, we don't have much contact with him. He came walking up to me and he said, Hey, Whitmire, he goes, you go to Lighthouse Baptist Church, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. And he said, are y'all doing Hell's Gates this year? I said, we sure are. And he goes, he goes, he said, we're bringing a group. And I, so we, we talked, and I said, I, said, I said, did you come last year? And he said, no. He said, I came the year before. It was the first. He did. <laughs> no, not for the, that was, <laughs> Might be rough that night. <laughs> no. But he, <laughs> he, uh, he said, uh, he, he, he let me, he said something to let me know. He came the first year that we did it because he said, man, that was awesome. He said, he said, I got on that. He said, I, he said, the very first, he said, I got on that bus. <laughs> and he said, he said, this crazy woman went to screaming. <laughs> I said, yes, she did. I didn't tell him that crazy woman was my wife. <laughs> he said, that woman can yell. I said, tell me about it. <laughs> he still don't know. The deer wants to know him. Don't tell him. <laughs> that is, but um, I said, we've taken that scene out. <laughs> He goes, oh, that was the best part. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's her claim to fame. She can scream. If you were there, you could see it. All right, hymn number 188. That had nothing to do with the song we we're going to sing. I just thought, I, that's just hilarious. I mean, I'm standing there going, do I tell him? Do I tell him? No, I'm not going to tell him. I'll just tell everybody at church. <laughs> hymn number 188, Happy This Is The Lord. Sing the first verse, the second verse, and then the chorus. All right, here we go. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within His favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Second verse. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me in close relation, having a part in His salvation. Happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if the teardrops start. I found the secret, it's Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that's worth the living, taking a trip. To heaven, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the
Amen. Well, if we could get our young people with a desire just to see God and Amen. take their eyes off the things of the world, what a great place we'd be. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight from the Word of God. If you'll have your Bibles ready to just turn from different references, then um, I do believe that uh, by the time we meet again, you'll have this in printed form that you maybe it'll something you can poke away somewhere um, and uh, have it just in case you were asked a question. Um, you know, occasionally we're asked if it is appropriate to use fear to persuade people to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. So there's four things I want to talk to you about. First of all, I want to talk to you about the reality of hell. <clears throat> in, the, in the Bible, there's a couple of words that um, uh, are translated hell in the, in the English Bible. There's the Greek word Hades. Eleven times it's used in, in the New Testament, and it's translated hell. And then Gehenna um, is, is 12 times translated as hell in the New Testament. Hades <clears throat> is, um, is the counterpart to the word Sheol in the Old Testament. Uh, Hades is the, the word that refers to the place that we would uh, think of as Abraham's bosom or the temporary place of holding for the dead. We know as Jesus spoke of the rich man and Lazarus, they, they spoke of Abraham's bosom, and on one there was a gulf between them, and one side was a place of torment in which uh, the rich man thirsted for water just to drop uh, uh, to a place upon his tongue, in which he also pleaded that some would go and warn his brother not to come to that place. And the other side, the paradise section, there's a punishment section and the paradise section. Um, that uh, is uh, the place where those who had put their faith in a Messiah to come waiting the, uh, the work of Christ on the cross so that they could be taken, captivity could be taken captive and carried uh, to heaven. <clears throat> and um, so, those, the, so uh, those that die without Christ are, are placed into that holding place uh, referred to as Hades. Um, it's uh, sometimes uh, people that, that wants to deny hell will say that, that is the grave, that's just the place of the dead. <clears throat> Um, but it, it, it has uh, the reason it, 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 there's such a synonym, syn uh, syn synonymous perhaps with the, the place of the dead is because um, it, is, uh, not the, it is not the permanent place of judgment. Uh, when Jesus spoke of judgment, he said, where, the, uh, where the, uh, the flame is not quenched, where the worm dieth not. Um, he used the word Gehenna, which um, comes, from, it's, uh, comes from a Hebrew word, uh, of the, the Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, which is the, the place of burning. And um, uh, 12 times that is used in the New Testament. And uh, in, in, in the Gospels, every time Hades or Gehenna is used, it was used by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so there's no doubt that Jesus spoke plainly and openly about both the temporary holding place for those uh, who die without Him as Savior and the permanent place of punishment. Um, uh, he spoke plainly of those, and um, uh, but in, did I ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 20? I should have. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 20. You know, some want to argue that the, uh, that the, the grave, the hell is just the grave. Um, you know, it's really hard to make that argument if you're, if you're an honest student of the Word of God. You have to really want to take and manipulate the Scriptures to deny the truth of hell, the truth of both um, a place of... of uh, immediate uh, punishment in which that uh, they're immediately now in a place where Abraham, where the rich man was placed uh, uh, that gulf between him and uh, uh, Lazarus and all the Old Testament saints, that place in which uh, 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 he's, he spoke of this, um, uh, this holding place. Um, but, um, but there's also clearly Jesus spoke of Gehenna, which is a, a place of everlasting punishment. Um, and, um, uh, but if you, if you were to deny all that, when we come to Revelation chapter 20, there's a clearest explanation of what will happen to people who have not trusted Christ. In Revelation chapter 20, and um, you can look uh, beginning at um, verse number 13. Um, and, the, the, and the Bible says, um, <clears throat> well, let's go back a little bit in verse number 12. <clears throat> or verse number 11. Why don't we start there? And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven, the heaven fled away, and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, 
small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's very important that we understand some things here. Uh, we're, we're about to, to, to see two different, two, two words, uh, the same English word, um, actually dead and death. But they're different Greek words. And I want to explain it to you. And he said, I saw the dead. Uh, those were the, that, that's referring, it's the, the Greek word nekros, which, um, you know, the modern word that's usually here of necromancy and, 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 and such as this, you know, it comes from that Greek word nekros, and, and it's referring to uh, literally a dead body. And it's referring to people that have, have literally just, just died. It's actually talking about a, a, a death as, a, uh, as not as a concept, but as, as a state. Um, and it, so it's saying, I saw the, the dead people, the people that died. Uh, but then we come down here and it said in verse number 13, and, and the sea gave up the dead. The, that's, the, that's that word again, necros, which means um, uh, that gave up the dead people. And death and hell delivered up the dead. And now here we see the word death. And that's a, that's a different Greek word. It's thanatos. And it literally is referring to separation. It's referring to the fact that the soul will one day be separated from the body. And, um, and, and ultimately, the, the, those who die without Christ will be separated from God. And so when it says death and hell, it's, it's referring to uh, you know, the, the concept that people that died without Christ are separated from God and have been placed in Hades. That's the word, the word hell there is Hades. And so what it's saying here is, is all those who died were separated from the, from the fellowship of God and placed in Hades. And they've been waiting there since the moment they died. And they're going to be called, summoned up. And, and, and they've already been through the, the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And they're going to be summoned up to stand before this great white throne. And what are they going to be judged by? They're going to be judged according to their works. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only hope that we have is the, is the salvation in Christ. And when we trust Christ, our name is written into the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And the Bible says here that the sea gave up the dead which were in them, the dead bodies of the dead, dead individuals, if you will, the people that, that were basically buried at sea. And death and hell, uh, uh, actually, the, and, and we can argue about the word sea there. We could talk of a literal sea or we could talk about the sea of separation. Uh, it's very, uh, there's a lot of um, um, metaphors in the, in the book of Revelation. And I literally believe it's talking about that everybody that died without Christ had been separated from God for all these years. And now they're summoned back into the presence of God. And, they're and it delivered up the dead which were in them. And there were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now the lake of fire here is a term that is synonymous with what we would get to in the, when the word hell comes from the Greek word Gehenna. Uh, that is the lake of fire. That is the place where the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not, a place of everlasting punishment. And, um, and, and so here it uh, doesn't use the, the word hell per se, but it uses uh, the, the term lake of fire. And verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So whether you want to argue what hell is, whether you want to argue what Hades means, whether you want to argue about Gehenna, uh, it, it, whether you want to go back and try to you know, debate this issue, of, uh, of what hell literally means in the New Testament. This is the clearest picture of the reality that people that die without Christ, whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, will be cast into the lake of fire. And by the way, if you go back and look <clears throat> a little bit earlier than that, look at verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And some people say where the beast and the false prophet were. But th that, that word are there talks as, 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 as the present tense. You know why? Because it's never ending <clears throat> and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the, the, the devil is being cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are at this point. And then later, the souls of all those who were without Christ, whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, are cast into that same lake of fire, which is described as a place of torment day and night forever and ever. Now, as much as I would like to stand before you tonight and say, I just don't believe in a place of eternal torment. I just think it's, 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 too, it's too horrible to, of a concept to get my mind around. And uh, I, as much as I would like to think that um, there's an ultimate annihilation, 
And that when people are cast in the lake of fire, that they, they literally are annihilated and cease to exist. All right? I would like to believe that. I would like to teach you that. I would like to say that, that hell itself is just uh, the fact that we're gonna, they're going to be away from God and we're going to be enjoying the presence of God and the blessings of God and the splendor of heaven and all the eternity that we have with God. And all of these people. Are, but the Bible says in verse number 10 that the devil, that the false prophet, the beast and the false prophet, and ultimately the unbelievers are going to be cast into a lake of fire and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, my friends, <clears throat> the first thing we've got to, got to get our grips around, our mind around, and get a grip, grip on it is: do we do we believe in a literal hell? Amen. Do we believe that people that are dying without Christ are going to be cast into hell? That they're going to they're going to spend a, 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 a season in a place called Hades, a holding place, until ultimately they're summoned before the great white throne, and they're going to be judged because of their sins, and and the the, the list of their sins will be a, a, a lifetime long. And will show that they've been sinners from birth and that they have no excuse uh, and that they, their greatest sin was rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting the opportunity that God gave them by way of creation that declared the glory of God, by way of conscience that declared their guilt before God, uh, uh, that uh, they, they rejected the grace of God which gave them the opportunity to put their faith and trust in the fact that, that there was a creator that, that would provide a savior. That the, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So they rejected uh, the, the guilt that was upon them. They rejected the glory that was given them. They rejected the grace that was given them. And, and, and they stand before God with no excuse. And Jesus, and this is what we depict in the judgment scene. A, a loving savior that had no desire that God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, a loving Savior that did not want anyone to die and go to hell, will ultimately have no choice but to cast them there because uh, they are the, the wages of sin is death. Now, if we believe that, how can we not? How could we walk by somebody's house at night and walk down the sidewalk and look and say, wow, those people are asleep up there and their house is on fire. <laughs> well, I hate to wake them. I hate to wake them. I hate to bother them. I hate to scare them. <laughs> uh, go banging on the door. It'll scare them to death if somebody comes banging in their house at, at two, 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Bob and Ann were here, Bob and Keithners, that were here this morning, I mentioned, in the Ministry of Evangelism training uh, that they have uh, in, um, in, in East Africa. They're here not too long ago. Um, they actually got moved back into their house. And uh, not too long ago, they were in their house, and they had been uh, burning some stuff in their fireplace. And, uh, they, you know, they live in Chester T, and all the houses there have, have wood shake shingles. And a little boy that, that's their next-door neighbor, he, he came in from playing in the yard and went up to his, to his dad and said, Daddy, <laughs> the neighbor's house is on fire. And sure enough, he went out on the back porch and saw the Kiefner's whole roof was engulfed in flames uh, because the sparks coming from their fireplace had, had blown back over on the roof of their house and caught their, whole, caught their house on fire. And, um, you know, and uh, they were grateful. Matter of fact, the paper ran a story, and it was like the young boy um, uh, rescues people from burning house or something like that, you know, because he went and told everybody that the house was on fire. You know, we, we'd think somebody was horrible if they, if they stood on the deck, and, and the dad said, yeah, that's pretty bad, ain't it? Huh. Let's go back in and watch the ball game. No, let's call the fire department. Let's let the neighbors know. Let's warn them, let them, want them to burn up in their house. And yet, you know, we're judge sometimes for warning people of something that, that we believe. Now, let me say this. The only reason a Christian in good conscience could not warn somebody about hell is if you didn't really believe in it. Because if you believe the Bible teaches a literal hell, if you believe in an ultimate judgment, and if you believe Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 10 is honest when it said that where they shall be tormented day and night forever and forever, if you believe that, that how could we not speak to warn somebody? So the first thing you know I want to address uh, tonight is number one, uh, <clears throat> the reality of hell, and we see that uh, in Revelation chapter twenty. Um, <clears throat> now the second thing I want to address tonight is, well, should we use fear? Is fear a, a proper approach? Take your Bibles to Matthew chapter ten. Matthew chapter ten. verse number 28. 
You know, so there, this, this whole chapter is dealing with Jesus teaching his disciples some things. And, um, you know, he, he tells them in the early part of the, early part of this chapter that, that they should be hated, they should be persecuted. The disciple is not above his master, verse 24, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that it shall not be revealed, nothing hid that shall not be known. So you know what? He's telling us right here. He's saying, you know, when you try to do things for, for my name, people are going to criticize you. People are going to say bad things about you. <clears throat> All right? And he goes on and says, um, <clears throat> You know, that God knows all about, uh, you know, the birds and the hairs of your head, uh, <clears throat> and you're more value than the sparrows. Um, uh, but, uh, but I want to look at verse number 28. <clears throat> he said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that word hell there is Gehenna, which is that, that, that eternal place of punishment. Okay? He's saying, Jesus literally tells his disciples that it's important that people fear being thrown into hell. Now, <clears throat> Christ himself sent this warning out. You know, um, we should not feel guilty about saying the same things that Jesus said. Jesus said that, that people ought to fear the fact that one day if they stand before God without Christ as their Savior, that, they, that there is one able to cast their soul and body into hell. And they're to fear that. You know, what we're trying to do in our country right now is inoculate people to this truth. Uh, everything is trying to be done to eliminate any fear of hell. Right. It's become a joke. It's become, uh, you know, anybody that believes in hell or ridiculous, you know, that it's just, you know, how can anybody, uh, it, it, people want to judge us because how, you know, the, the, the argument is how could a, how could a loving God, I don't want to, if, if I wouldn't, I don't want to believe in a God who would send people to eternal punishment, you know, you know, and, and we could spend the rest of the, the night talking about the rationale behind that. But that's not, the, that's not the case of this lesson. The case of this lesson is to help you realize that Jesus used the concept of fear to warn people of the need to be saved. And um, if, if that was a good enough method for Jesus Christ, if he told his disciples to fear the fact that people should fear the fact of being thrown into hell, then should not we feel confident that that would be something that it would be legitimate for us to use? I believe that. I, I don't, I, listen, you know, if, uh, if Jesus has said here, if he said, now, disciples, here's what I want you to say. You know, I want you to, to win people to me because I want them to love me. All right? I don't want them to be motivated by fear to come to me. So what I want you to do is go preach the love of Christ, but never preach judgment. Well, you've got to realize that Jesus preached judgment more than he talked about uh, he talked about the kingdom of God, but when he talks about rewards and, and heaven, he spoke more in the gospels of judgment than he did rewards. I mean, you see over and over again where he speaks. As a matter of fact, he said plainly, Luke chapter 13, verse 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, he spoke of repentance. He spoke of judgment. He spoke of, he spoke of, uh, of, of you know, even in his parables, over half of the parables speak of judgment. Jesus was not ashamed to, to use the concept of fear. Matter of fact, um, I think that, uh, you know, if we, if we go to our, our, our next point, um, you'll see, go to the, the book of Jude in chapter number one. <clears throat> you'll see that in the epistles, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times people say, well, the, the gospels tell us about Jesus, but the epistles tell us about our methodology. Well, that's great. Then let's look at the methodology that the epistles teach us about how we're to do the, the work of the Great Commission. You know, some people say, well, G the Gospels tell us about Jesus and the kingdom of heaven, but we ought to get, uh, the, for, the, for the Christian, our methodology should come from the epistles. In the book of Acts, we see um, how God worked in that early church. But let's get our doctrine. Let's get our, and I don't agree with all. I think the, the Bible, I think, the, you know, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. 
I don't think you just have to say, well, we, we don't learn how to operate the church from the epistles. Uh, I think there's stuff to be gleaned from the, from the gospels, from the book of Acts, and, and from the epistles, and even, you know, throughout the entire Bible. Um, but, so, if we want to turn to the, the book of Jude, look at um, verse number 22. <clears throat> the Bible says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, what this passage teaches us is that some people were going to be won through love. That some people, the Bible says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. We're going to make a difference in some people's life by showing them uh, the love of Christ. Showing them that, uh, uh, that you know, as we love them um, and we help them and we reach out to them. There's some people who are beat down and they know they're sinners and they just feel like there's no hope for them. And we show them that God loves them. The, the Bible tells us that, uh, uh, that God committed his love toward us. And while we're yet, yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Uh, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, the love of God brings some people to repentance. And we know that. And so we do preach the, the message of love. It's not all a message of judgment. But the Bible teaches us that, uh, and others save with fear. Some people are going to be motivated by fear. You know, that's just the same way it is in life. We had this media um, training clinic not too, not too long ago, and Brother Wilson was teaching on marketing. And he said that there are two great uh, things that motivate people. One's the, the promise of reward, and the other's the, the, the fear of loss. They're two great motivators. Some people do what they do because they want to gain something. Some people do what they do because they're afraid of, of punishment or loss or, or, or um, uh, humiliation or, or anything that comes from, from fear. Well, that's, just, that's the same thing that we see here in, in this passage, that some people will come to Christ because they're drawn to him because of the love that he has and that, and that believers have. But other people... You know, perhaps they've, they've grown up in a, you know, I know a lot of people say, oh, I just believe God is love, and I know God loves me, and I know, you know, and, 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 and they really don't uh, have any fear of judgment. And they'll die and go to hell because uh, they never understand that the same, the, the Bible says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of the Lord. There's two sides to Christ. There's the side of love, and there's the side that he's the great judge of the universe. And then one day, people are going to come before that great white throne of judgment and be judged according to their deeds because their names are not written in the book of life. And they need to know that, Tom, um, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And um, so the message of fear is relevant for us as believers because we're going to win some through love, but we're going to win others through fear. Now, what we want in America is a message of all love. But it's the same thing that I teach you in parenting. All right, the Bible tells to, to train up your fathers to provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And for children to be raised properly, there needs to be a balance of nurture. That's cultivating the good. Admonition, that's correcting the bad. There needs to be a balance of relationship and authority. If all you want is to have a relationship with your children, one day they're going to disrespect you so much that, they, that the relationship you desire will be de deteriorated because you have no... They have you know, no authoritative respect for you. On the other hand, if all you teach, all you do is um, deal with them authoritatively and build no relationship, they're going to rebel against your authority because uh, they don't think that you love them. They don't think you care about them. You're just trying to be a, a, a lord or, or, or a disciplinarian. The same way we need to balance the view of God. We see his love, but we also see that we are going to you know, stand before him one day and uh, that uh, he's going to judge us according to to whether we've been saved or lost uh, in our sins. And, uh, and he will make, he'll, he's the one who will make, ultimately make that decision. The people need to, be, need to fear the fact um, uh, that they're going to stand before him. So we, 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 we're pulling them out of the fire. What, what, what is the, the, here's this metaphor again of fire. Why is that? Because uh, I believe it, it's a direct representation to the fact that, uh, that they're going to they're die and go to a place of eternal torment where the Bible refers to as a lake of fire. And so we're to, we're to save them, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, helping them realize that they're headed for a fiery judgment, and we're to rescue them from the flames. And uh, so when we look at, at this, uh, this program, Hell's Gates, is it ethical? Well, how could you not think it's ethical when the Scriptures tell us that we're going to win some with love, we're going to win others with fear? 
You know, and, and, and truthfully, we have both of those. That's one of the reasons that I want to balance our program. That's one of the reasons why I want them to, to, um, uh, to see a compassionate side. You know, I love. I want to see that the, the, the martyrs are not angrily rejecting, rebelling against the government. The martyrs are devotedly in love with Christ. Okay, I want them to see that we, we, we talked about this when 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 Christ is portrayed in the judgment scene, he doesn't angrily cast them into hell. He broken heartedly casts them into hell, not willing. He, he expresses in the dialogue there that I, I didn't want you to go that path. I, I, I witnessed you. I, I did everything I could to woo you to myself, but you rejected me. And now I have no choice because the, the law of sin and death requires that you be separated from me eternally. But then we also have the victorious side of heaven in which we see the people who are embraced by Christ and uh, who are entering into his loving abode for eternity and being rewarded for their labors and, and um, those who have given to the Lord, how Christ recognizes that. And so we see both uh, the compassionate side of God, but we also see that there is the fearful side of his judgment. And we'll win some by both methods. Uh, and uh, it is not inappropriate for us to use fear, both because, number one, we believe in a literal hell. Number two, because Jesus warned people to fear yes. being cast into hell. Number three, because uh, the scriptures teach us that some will be won by fear. Those who will be motivated by love will be won by love. And fear will, will probably not drive them to Christ. But there's a group of people out there who will never be won except by the fear of dying and going to hell. Amen. You see, I, I, I'll tell you this right now. If all I, if I never had, I mean, you know, the truth is, when, when I, what brought me to Christ was this reality of the fear that I would die and go to hell. And it was the fear of hell that, 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 that kept convicting me, kept convicting me. Now I know the love of Christ, and I understand that God loved me so much that he sent a Savior. But it was the fear of hell that brought me to God. And I, I listen, I'm glad that I had that conscious fear of hell. I'm glad that I grew up in an environment where hell was still preached, and, and there was still this, uh, this uh, fearful um, reality in our lives and the devil is doing everything he can our culture is doing everything they can to eliminate the fear of hell the reality of hell and um and even try to make us feel guilty by warning people of a literal hell now let me give you the fourth reason why i feel like not only reasonable and ethical but it is our responsibility take your bibles to ezekiel chapter 33 ezekiel 33 This is for you, but it's also, you know, I heard, a, I don't know, if it, my wife was, was reading a book one time, I think an article, and, and the guy that wrote the article was an atheist. You might could remind me who it is after, after service. I can't think of the guy right now, but he was an atheist, and um, he didn't believe in God, and he didn't believe in heaven or hell, and he didn't believe in all the things that we believe in, but he made this statement. He said it, it seemed appalling to him that so many people could call themselves Christians and say they believed in these things, and yet never tell anybody, and never warn anybody. And, you know, if, he said, I can't imagine that if I believed in a hell, like you say there's a hell, I would spend my waking hours trying to warn people not to go there. Well, in Ezekiel chapter 33, and verse 7, the Bible says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked... O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You know, uh, there's this concept here of our responsibility the Bible said, to whom much is given, much is required. Paul made this statement. He said, I'm free from the blood of all men. What was he talking about there? He was talking about this concept, this uh, responsibility of people who know the truth, warning people who don't know the truth. We're not responsible to make sure everybody gets saved. We're not going to win everybody to Christ. Uh, but we are responsible to do everything we can with the opportunity God gives us to warn people. You know, that's why the Bible says in Acts 1.8, that go in all the world and preach the gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Okay, we're trying our best through worldwide missions, through gospel television to get the message around the world, but that doesn't eliminate us from reaching our Jerusalem. Amen. And this program is one of the ways that we're doing all that we can to reach our Jerusalem. 
Because Jerusalem is not just uh, uh, the areas that we cover in our bus routes. It's, just, it's not just the community in which you live in. It's our North Georgia. Okay? And, and we, we're reaching beyond North Georgia into Alabama and into uh, Tennessee and North Carolina and South Carolina. We're reaching into regions. We've even had people come up from Florida. We had a group last year that said they were coming down from Indiana. I, I'm not sure if they're coming this year. They, they actually planned to come on the weekend and we weren't having it. So, you know, I mean, I can't help that. Um, we put it on the website. Uh, but all I'm trying to say is this, is that um, we have a responsibility to warn those within our Jerusalem. And um, the Bible tells us that if we know this truth, and we sit, I mean, you know what? It's wonderful for us to sing about heaven sounding sweeter all the time. You know, we sing about um, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. You know, but, you know, it's great we can come in here and sing about, um, you know, uh, some glad day we shall see Jesus in the air coming. You know, and we, we sing all our songs about heaven and about victory and all that stuff. That's great. But, but, you know, there's a world of people out there that don't know what we know. You remember the story of the, of the men that uh, were outside the gate and they were lepers and the, uh, and the, 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 the battle had come against um, the children of Israel and, and, um, and uh, they said, man, if we sit here, we're going to die. Let's go over to the, the, the other side and let's just see if, if they'll have mercy on us. And so when they got over there, they found out that the, God had defeated them. He had he'd caused them to believe that they were being attacked. They fought against one another and they all fled and left everything they had. And they're sitting there feasting on all the spoils that were left behind. And one of them looked at the other and said, we don't do, we do not well. This is not good. We can't sit here and enjoy all this while our brethren over there are starving to death. You know, now think about this. They were lepers. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, they were the outcast. Okay? They weren't even welcomed by those people. And yet they felt a responsibility. That's what Paul said. He said, uh, he said I'm a debtor to both the, the Jew and the Greek. Okay? He said, I, I owe a debt. Why did he owe a debt? Because he knew the truth about Jesus Christ. And if we know the truth about Jesus Christ, and we don't do what we can to warn those around us, and preach that gospel around the world, then we're not going to be able to stand before God and be free from the blood of all men. Literally, we may actually feel the, 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 the guilt of those being cast into the lake of fire. We may sense the blood upon our hands that we didn't warn them. Now, are we going to get everybody in the doors of this church and try to, try to preach the gospel to them? No, that's not going to happen. They're just not coming. But last year, we had over 7,000 people that came on this property that heard the message. Okay? I'm just saying that God has opened up an, an effectual door for us to fulfill our responsibility to the Great Commission. Amen. Now, so I give you four reasons why I feel like it's both biblical and ethical. Number one, because we believe in the reality of a little hell. Number two, because Jesus himself warned to, to be uh, a fearful of being thrown into hell. Number three, because the Bible teaches plainly that some will be won by love, but, but others will be won by fear. And number four, because God has placed, listen, not only a, a commission, but a responsibility. That we have a mandate from God. Remember one time years ago, I was pastoring in Brookhaven. And we had, we had a visitation group going out one night. And we loaded some people down in the van and sent them over, I'd send them over to an apartment project. And asked them to go in there and pass out tracts, knock on doors and witness to people. And we got back that, I, got, I went one direction with another group, and that group went one direction. And we got back later that night, and we were discussing. I said, well, how'd your visits go? And they said, well, we, we got back early, we, well, and they kind of stumbled around. And finally they said, um, well, when we got there, there was a sign at the entrance that said, um, no soliciting. And I said, well, now, I'd already been to the place and kind of scoped it out. Uh, I said, well, now, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a gate there, was there? No, no, it was wide open. I see, I, I, I'm pretty sure there wasn't a gate. Uh, I mean, I've never asked anybody to climb a gate. Okay. I've I never asked anybody to break down a door. Okay. I've never asked anybody to commit a crime. Okay. Uh, but they said, but it said no soliciting. I said, well, listen, I've gotten approval by a higher authority to go in there. And they said, you did? I said, yeah. Let me show you. Matthew 28. All power is given to me. That word power, there's authority. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore in all the world. Okay? I, I said, now, I wouldn't ask you to break a door down. I wouldn't ask you to climb a fence and, and go through, you know, a barbed wire or electrical fence or anything like that. But if the door is open, 
I said, you go in there on the authority of Jesus Christ. And they said, okay. Next week we went back there and we won some people to Christ. Amen. Ultimately, there was a young man, him and his wife, were um, students. They were, they were, they'd come to study at Georgia State University from China. And um, Tim and Sammy Gao. And uh, uh, they started attending our church. And after several weeks attending our church, they trusted Christ as Savior. It wasn't long after that that uh, Tim got cancer. And it uh, was only a few months later that he went to be with the Lord. But in that short time that he was with us, he was translated from the power of the kingdom of darkness to the, tra to, the, to the kingdom of God's dear son. He was translated from a destination of hell to a destination of heaven. And you know what? It's because we recognized that we have been given authority from the king of kings and lord of lords to go in all the world and preach the gospel. And so we not only have a mandate, but we have the authority of God himself to send us forth to proclaim that good news. Amen. And I'll not... What did Jesus say to his disciples? You know what? They're going to say things about you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to criticize you. But don't let that bother you any. Don't be afraid of man. I just want to stand before God one day and believe that we've done all we could and we're free from the blood of all men. Amen? And that's the four best reasons I can give you. I could go on and on and on and give you some other stuff, but I think that's the top four reasons why I would tell you that it's both scriptural and ethical that we perform hell's gates. Do we want to be manipulative? No. Do I want to try to, um, to, to, go, to overtly manipulate people's emotions to get them to say things that they don't mean? No. Do we want, when we come and give the invitation, um, we give the invitation in such a manner that we make it very plain that it's their decision. It's up to them. They can choose to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Is it something where we just all get them to repeat a prayer together? No, we don't do that. We ask them, uh, are they willing to make a decision to, to accept Christ as Lord and Savior? And then we ask them later, if they made that decision, will they, will they stop by a table, fill out a card, write their name down. On every card that we have counted a decision, we have a name. We have, uh, you know, usually an individual's address or, or some kind of email address that we know where they came from. Um, we don't just kind of show our hands. We're not asking. We're not just trying to get notches on our New Testament, so to speak. You know, we're trying to actually bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to do it ethically. We don't want to do it um, in a way that's, um, that's manipulative. We're not, somebody said, I just don't think you ought, to, you ought to try to scare children into getting saved. <laughs> Listen, it's very plain that we don't, uh, it's not appropriate for children. It's for teenagers and up. It's for uh, people that have reached the place where they're able to understand the concept of the, of the tribulation period and not be scared into, you know, I want people having nightmares over this. Unless, I don't mind an adult having a nightmare over it. I, you know, I had nightmares. When I was 17, 18 years old, I, was, I had nightmares about dying and going to hell. And you know what it did, me, it did for me? It helped me realize that when, when I got witness to that I, wasn't, I needed to make the right decision. I'm glad that I was afraid of hell. Why? Because now I'm saved on my way to heaven. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to try to manipulate people into doing something they don't want to do. Somebody asked me the question, don't you think it's a little manipulative? I said, let me ask you something. Do you genuinely, do you, do you genuinely think then an adult's going to come in there and sit down and watch all that. First of all, they know that nobody's going to throw them. This is a dramatization. We, we say it's uh, you know, interactive, but nobody, they don't really, you know, if, if, if those people were standing in line thinking, I might get shot, they're going to get out of line. Right. If they, well, they might just literally throw me in the fire. They're going to get out. They know it's a dramatization. All right? They don't really feel any sense of immediate danger to themselves. Well, yeah, yeah well, you're, you're trying to, Scare them into to believe in something. My friends, we live in an age in which people believe what they believe. Now, we're not scaring people into believing something that they don't believe. What we're doing is shocking them into the reality of the urgency to make a decision while there's still time. And if they don't believe when they come in and they're rejecting that gospel message, they'll probably leave the same way they came. If they have a conscience of Christ and a conscience of the need to be saved, if they're presented with the gospel and they understand it clearer than they understood it before, then they, make, they may make a decision to receive Christ as their Savior. But it'll only be because they believe and not because we manipulated them to believe. What we're doing with the program is shocking them into the reality that that trumpet's going to sound and one day there are people going to be left behind. And they need to do it while there's still time. Today's the day of salvation. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And so, the program is not try to manipulate somebody by fear to do something they don't believe. 
but by to shock them into the, the, the awareness that they need to do it while there's still time. The urgency of the need to accept Christ that they're willing to believe in. And so that's my answer to is it scriptural, is it, is it ethical, is it biblical? I believe it is. And I believe we're fully justified. And ultimately, there's going to be people who don't agree with us. There's going to be people who criticize us. One day, we could hit the newspapers, and people uh, it could be all over the front page what we're doing. It could be on the TV set. We could be on the news. But you know what? The only person I really fear is one that I'm going to stand before one day and give account of my life. Amen? And I'm glad that we're in this thing together. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for the opportunity to represent you. I do pray, God, that, that we would not be hindered by any um, distractions. I'd rather not have to battle press or bad publicity. I'd rather us be able to operate freely. You said as much as lies with us, we should live peaceably with all men, and that we desire to do that. We're not trying to provoke uh, any controversy. We're not trying to be sensational in the way we do it. But God, I do pray you'd bless us. I, I pray you'd bless our sincerity of trying to uh, ethically and um, Lord, in good conscience, present the gospel to individuals in multiple ways so that they come through the program having understood clearly what it means to be saved, what, it, what salvation is not. God, we want to do that. We, Holy Spirit, we pray that in every scene that your presence is there. Um, and we, we trust you to do the work in the hearts that only you can do. We pray, God, that you'd help us to maintain um, uh, a consistency in the way we present it so that um, we, we never... Uh, get beyond uh, what is what is right and what is appropriate. But God, we pray more than anything else that you'd use us to make a difference in the eternal destination that we do all that we can to keep people out of hell. You died on the cross to pay for their salvation. Lord, may we bear that good news to as many as we can. We'll give you glory. I pray, God, you'd bless every person that's got every part in I pray, God, you'd bless our church. I pray you'd put a hedge of protection about us so that people would stay healthy, so that people would be able to do what they need to do, so that we wouldn't have interruptions and hindrances. I pray for good weather. I pray, Lord, that, that the, the message of the program would get out to, so that many, many people that you would have to be saved will come through and make a decision, a genuine decision to be born again. And for all of that, God, we'll give you the glory. Bless us as we work for you, and we'll give you the glory for it all in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Perhaps you'd like to spend some time in prayer and ask God's blessings. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, and you've been quickened by the reality of hell, meet me at this altar. Meet me right down here tonight, and I'll take the Bible and help you find Christ as your Savior. It'd be a crying shame to be a part of a church that's reaching out to thousands, and, and you leave here lost without knowing Christ as your Savior. Be saved before you leave here if you're not tonight. Amen? Step out and come and receive Christ. Would you pray that God would bless the Hell's Gates program? Could we, could we cover it together that we're trusting God to do something this year in a mighty way that we can genuinely see the hand of God? Something so, so amazing that it would have to be clear to everybody that something God has done. Would you come and join us in prayer on this verse? Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection. I really hope the broadcast was a blessing to you today. These programs are produced through Lighthouse Global Studios, which is a ministry of Lighthouse Baptist Church. We broadcast them locally, and we also send them out through Christian Media International for broadcasting all the world. I want to personally invite you to attend Lighthouse Baptist Church. I believe you could be a part in helping us get the gospel around the world. I also believe that our church could be a blessing to you and your family. We have programs that minister to youth and adults, and we have music that's enjoyable and worshipful. I believe you'd find our people to be friendly and to be welcome. Once again, thank you for watching Faith Connection today. And I do hope the program was a blessing. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God.